Latter-day Peace Studies is produced by peace-loving members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Any views expressed herein are not to be taken as official positions of the Church or its authorities. Latter-day Peace Studies presents Come Follow Me. I'm Shiloh Logan. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thank you for joining us as we discuss this week's reading of Come Follow Me, as outlined by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're recording these podcasts from our homes, and so you'll often hear children playing, dogs barking, and babies crying. This is our life, and we love it. Our hope is that as we discuss these scriptures and truths, we will come to a more perfect understanding through experiencing the atonement of Jesus Christ and find greater peace in our lives. All right, Ben, we are back. We are talking about Mormon Eight through, no, I, we're not. We're talking about <laughs> seven through nine. We almost missed out a chapter right there. <laughs> oh, and it's a really good one. It's a really good one. It's the last one that Mormon gives, so we can't miss out on that one. No. So we're going to go through uh, chapter seven, eight, and nine, and this is going to end the Book of Mormon, the end of the Book of Mormon in the Book of Mormon, but we you know we we'll still have Ether and Moroni, but man, last week was really difficult getting through all of the tragedy and reading his farewell and that lamentation at the end, that was that was rough. These chapters are just, I don't know, they're very poignant to me. They stand out and are very contrasting. You know, you have Mormon and then Moroni writes 8 and 9, but chapter 7 is Mormon's last chapter. Then he dies, and... And he's killed in battle, and it seems to be that he maybe he's killed in battle before he actually thinks he is, and so he doesn't actually give us a farewell like everybody else does. These chapters for me stand out as, what what would you say if you knew you were going to die? And if you knew this was the, not just that you were getting old and going to die, but death had been such a prominent feature in your entire life. And not just death, a natural death, but destruction, like absolute carnage and destruction and chaos and hatred and villainy and the secret combinations and the oaths and all of these things culminating around you to where no one even listens to anything that is talked about with God anymore. And you simply are a witness having a knowledge of God and having this view of God and literally no one will listen to you about the goodness of God. And they just curse God, they wish to die, and they destroy themselves. What do you say when you're done? Like, like, what's the last thing you say? So for me, that's a lot of the kind of the, the spirit that I read 7, 8, and 9 in today, and that uh, I've been thinking about this week. And so with that, with chapter 7, just a quick overview. In chapter 7, we have Mormon who is talking about the Lamanites, and he's he's inviting everyone to be able to repent and to be baptized and to know God. And you can see him rejoicing in the resurrection of the dead. You know, we'll get into what he says more in detail, but after he's done, and it's a really short chapter, then Moroni kicks in and he's he lets us know his father just died in battle. Now, he has a few things to talk about. Then with that, he goes through and he talks about the coming forward of the Book of Mormon, and he talks about how the affairs of the church will be when the Book of Mormon comes forward. And so he's seen our day. He knows what's going to happen. And so he's talking to us about when these words come forward. And then we end up with chapter nine. And this is kind of an interesting chapter because he specifically identifies those who do not believe in Christ. And then he just, he just like this hammer, he comes down <laughs> He comes down on these people who don't believe in God, and he's basically thinking, it's like, when the earth is rolled in as a scroll, and you die in the end of days, will you think that there wasn't a God? And it's just <laughs> this really interesting way of, like, <laughs> being able to convert people. And I don't know how effective that particular thing is, but then I started to think about who Moroni was when he very first took over writing this. And he thinks he's going to bury the plates and not going to say anything more about it. And this is his last statement. Right. All he's ever known from the time he's younger to the time to now, his father just died. We've already had the death count. 220, 230,000 people have died. All of the leaders in their 10,000s. Even, even with such a pillar and such a person as Moroni, could I possibly entertain in the sorrow that I feel anger and resentment, those feelings towards the Lamanites? And towards even your own people. We read Mormon's lamentation with just a great deal of sorrow. And I think the greatest deal of sorrow there for me was that he shows that 
it didn't have to happen. This wasn't written in stone, as it were. It you could have changed. So all you had to do was look, right? Yeah. And so if I look at Moroni this way, and I'm just, I'm like, man. I don't even know how to follow that up. So it was, it was pretty heavy in reading these chapters, but he goes through and he talks about our needs to repent. And so Mormon is talking about our need to repent and be baptized and the glories of, of the resurrection of the dead. And so both Mormon and Moroni will talk about the resurrection of the dead and how glorious this is that Christ overcame this. And I can only imagine like, why did they bring that up here at the very end? Like what's going on? I'm like, oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. Lots of You've just seen dying. the death. A lot of people are dying. You've just seen the complete and utter destruction and desolation of your entire civilization. That one thing will bring you peace. And so I can imagine what's on their mind. Your father just died. And he's been an integral part in your life. And he's he's the one who taught you and brought you within, into the relationship with God. And now he's gone. Of course you're going to rejoice in this Christ that has overcome death because that means you will see him again. So yeah, just a lot of stuff here, a lot of really great things. Yeah, Moroni, it seems pretty clear that he intends this to be his last words. He throws in what must have given him, or the last things that Mormon wrote, that he knew were going to be his last words, and put them on the plates. That's what we see in chapter 7. Moroni picks it up and he says, I'm going to finish the record of my father Mormon. He writes these chapters 8 and 9. Obviously, he didn't divide them into chapters 8 and 9, but he writes this last part. And then it's obvious at the end of chapter 9 that he intends this to be the end of what he's doing. And he says a couple times he doesn't know how long he's going to live, whether he's going to live or die. And so he's trying to finish up this record. I almost imagine him taking this and burying it and then wandering around a little bit and being like, okay. Well, I'm not dead yet. This is getting kind of boring. Maybe I should go. <laughs> maybe I should go check out those records again. I imagine him, you know, kind of going back and and maybe reviewing all the work of his father, right? And finding ether and being like, okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna throw this in here. I've got a little bit of space. We're gonna throw that in there. And then after he's done with ether, in fact, I believe he says in the Book of Moroni, I di- I didn't think I was gonna live. But since I'm still living and I got nothing else to do, <laughs> um, I'm going to write some more. And man, thank goodness, because Book of Moroni is spectacular. It's just so good. I can see a change to Moroni in the Book of Moroni. Um, he even includes a couple more sermons of his, of his father's in there. But I can see a different Moroni in the way that he talks from some of these chapters here. Now, it's it's not a completely different person. You know, it's the same person in terms of his testimony of Christ, but he definitely has had some more experiences in his life and is focusing on some particular things. So very interesting how this ends out here again, Moroni intending this to be the last of his words and him imagining all that's going to be left of my entire civilization is whatever we can get on these plates. And, you know, Mormon is thinking the same thing and he tells Moroni, this is all that's going to survive. You referenced that uh, Moroni had some possible frustration or maybe exasperation might be the right word for it. I, you know, maybe there's some anger mixed there. I'm not sure. In some of the way that he's he's talking to people, we sense that a little bit with, with Mormon. There's no way that I could put myself in, in their shoes and not totally understand that. I've certainly gotten at least that angry over spilling something on my floor. So um, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not a not a comparison. But um, Moroni here, or, or sorry, this is Mormon in, in chapter 7. He starts off speaking. He says he's addressing the remnant of the house of Israel. And I think it's interesting that he terms it that way because ultimately he's actually addressing everybody because the point is that we're all to be adopted into the house of Israel. So in one sense, everybody in the entire world is a remnant of the house of Israel because we are all to be adopted and symbolically adopted into that symbolic covenant of the house of Israel. These are just the terms that he uses to speak. Gets a little bit poetic here with this repetition, know ye, know ye, know ye. I was noticing that these are not questions, or at least when the punctuation was added, the question marks were not put in. I don't know if if Mormon intended these to be questions or imperatives. I would be curious to ask someone who's dealt with 
some of that um, original man not original manuscript, but earliest text type stuff that Royal Skousen did. If they have any insight on this, if there was ever any discussion about whether these should be periods or question marks and, and why one or the other. In any case, the way that they're set right now is with periods. And so these are actually imperatives. They're telling us to know something, right? Know ye that ye are of the house of Israel. Know ye that ye must come unto repentance. I like that phrase there, come unto repentance. Sometimes we say come unto Christ, and this is almost just another way of phrasing this. Come unto repentance. Come unto this new way of viewing yourself, God, and the world. Know ye that ye must lay down your weapons of war, and delight no more in the shedding of blood, and take them not again, save it be that God shall command you. Now, this is very strongly related to uh, verses that we find in Doctrine and Covenants 98 that we've discussed at length. Um, so if we go over to, to D&C 98, we see what the Lord tells directly to Joseph Smith about this concept here. Verses 32 and 33 of D&C 98, Behold, this is the law I gave unto my servant Nephi, and thy fathers Joseph, and Jacob, and Isaac, and Abraham, and all mine ancient prophets and apostles. And again, this is the law that I gave unto mine ancients, that they should not go out unto battle against any nation, kindred, tongue, or people, save I the Lord commanded them. So, yeah, referencing back here, what uh, Mormon tells us is that we need to lay down our weapons of war. I'm not sure what that means coming from Mormon, right? <laughs> Someone who, who died in, in battle with potentially a sword in his hand. I'm not sure quite what that means coming from him, but ultimately this this phrase, delighting no more in the shedding of blood, is certainly a step in that direction that we need to really tone down the glorification of war and, and violence in general. Yeah, this is such a fascinating verse. It's such a fascinating verse. On one side, I, it's a little frustrating because... In a lot of scripture, and even in Latter-day Revelation and, and what the Latter-day Prophets have said, there is never an unequivocal call for peace. There is always a, you know, we seek for peace, we look for peace, we do all these things for peace, but go out and kill whenever we need to, right? And, and so there's always like this back door out. And sometimes I'd be like, you know what, let's just, if you're going to say it, say it. If you're going to come down on it and be like, listen, put away your weapons of war, don't do this thing, ever. And say it. But I think in a lot of ways, I've had to tone down, especially since we've started doing the podcast, we've talked about these things. I've been pouring over a lot of these uh, kind of nonviolent messages. You know, I'm a nonviolence guy. I started to realize the love of God in incremental degrees and about how he brings these incremental degrees through and how he meets his children where they're at. How in a lot of cases, the point here is that conversion has to come first, and then there's the relinquishing of, of weapons and, and arms. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the pattern that's set by like the anti-Nephi-Lehi's right. and the Lamanites in Helam and Six. There is never this, well, let's get rid of all of the weapons first and then try to be peaceful, right? Right. Because like President Benson said, the world looks from works from the outside in, and the Lord works from the inside out. And so if we were always like just to focus on putting the weapons away, it's a bit like putting the cart before the horse. If we just focus on getting rid of the weapons, we're not actually taking heart, well, I guess taking to heart the heart. It's not, we're not going to the source of the matter. When I read the Book of Mormon, I've read it through this time, I've, I've seen, it's, it's the same kind of uh, strategic message I see Jesus Christ coming out when he says to love your enemies. Because in a lot of ways, I don't, it's a very long discussion. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I don't see God having enemies. That word enemy, I don't see having any utility to God. To have a God who is omniscient and has all knowledge in all things, and he knows who and what everything is, to have, to posit that this other thing existing in reality that is not consciously living in the reality that it lives in. So for instance, if there's this reality that God lives in, and he's the perfect totality of that whole reality. And there is an enemy. That means that this thing that is counter God is an entity that is not living according to this reality that it lives in, right? And so how would God be perceived that as his enemy? To see an entity that is that is just not living in reality is somehow like his enemy? Like how does that how does that even work? 
Or, you know, we say, well, Satan is God's enemy because Satan is actively working against God's interests in bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of men. But even that, you know, if you want to take a Jungian kind of psychological approach to Satan, or if you want to take even a metaphysical approach to Satan, however you want to take this, that still just doesn't hold water. How? Because God knows that Satan himself is not living in reality. He's not living in a conscious view of reality, shall we say. And neither are people who are following after him. And how can he be mad at them for, for, for doing that? When I have my children and they're growing up and they're in their in kind of these, these states of innocence, and sometimes they know exactly what they're doing and sometimes they don't. And they say something to me that, that they're angry with me. You know, like two, three years old. It's like, dad, you're, you're, a, you're a mean dad kind of a thing. But they're two years old. I'm not taking that to heart. I'm like, it's a two-year-old. <laughs> and so I, I don't personalize what my two-year-old is saying. I'm like, my two-year-old is learning how to be a two-year-old. And I don't, I don't project that kind of a, a personalization to what may know that my two-year-old hates me. And so it's kind of a crude example of seeing this. But when I see that God is not having an enemy, but he says to love your enemies, why didn't God just come right out and say, hey, listen, guys, you have no enemies. Like, like enemy thi- this enemy thing that you've created is not a thing. Why didn't he just come out and say that? If God doesn't exist with having your enemies, why didn't he just come out to say that just point blank? And as I've thought about this over the years, I've come to at least one idea. There's a lot of other things that I've thought about that kind of circle around this and that fit in with this. But at least in part, it's because the whole point is to have the experience of overcoming our ego into coming into the relationship and the experience of loving our enemies. If God just comes out and says, hey, y'all, you don't have enemies, we can understand that consciously. We And we might even be able to argue it and pontificate about it and write articles about it and be able to like expound upon it, all without ever experiencing it. But the fact is, is that the command to love your enemies is an action verb. It commands us to go forward and to have a physical experience with loving our enemies. He's commanding us to go have this experience with a consciousness, this experience of love with our experience of enemies. And he's commanding us to bring these two experiences together and then to see what happens. And it's my experience that as I've tried to practice this, and I fail at it all the time, but as I've tried to practice this, I've come with these little glimpses in my life where the experiences that happen, I cannot put words to. I cannot communicate to another human being the true power of the experience that I've had when I have truly gone out consciously and with a desire to love my enemies. Now, as I said, I fail on it every day in that I still have this, these perceptions of like, you know, people that annoy me and frustrate me and all these things that go on. And, and I don't judge myself anymore about how I'm supposed to be in relation to them. But the glimpses come when I come into these very intimate moments with God, where if God would have just told me, hey, Shiloh, there are no enemies. This whole thing that you've constructed is your ego. Just, and he would have just left it at that as an idea, or even as a pontificating about reality, it would never have led me into those moments of action in having experiences with my enemies. I would have just been focused on like mentally constructing and like seeing people as not my enemies. I would never have gone out to actually being with them. When I read this verse here in Mormon 7, and it says, know ye that you must lay down your weapons of war. Well, yeah, eventually we will. Beating swords into plowshares and not learning war anymore in in the Holy Mountain, you know, and that our whole life is a temple. Borrowing from Isaiah there. And then I see his follow-up. Mormon's like, you've got to lay down your weapons of war. And in my American context, it's like, we've got to lay down our weapons of war. You know, our our own Americana, man, we are so entrenched with weapons of war as means of defense. We've got to defend ourselves. We are so the Nephites here. I mean, we are, we are, so, <laughs> we, we are Nephites through and through. Americans right. are Nephites. I don't know if it's about America. I don't know what it is about the Americas, but man, the Nephites of old and their swords and Americans today and our guns. I'm radically pro second amendment because I don't believe in using force and violence and coercion on my neighbor to take away his gun, even though I'm a nonviolence guy. I can't, I can't justify violence on my neighbor to have him forcefully de- disarmed just because I don't agree with it. So I have to I have to be pro second amendment so that I don't personally want to go out there and and just shoot my enemy. And there I know there's a lot of people who disagree with that. Who vehemently disagree with that. 
man, I've spent the last five years on social media arguing with people who vehemently and still vehemently disagree with me with on, on that. And that's perfectly fine. My personal relationship with Christ in living this way does not require them to do so. That's one of the powerful things I think is about the nonviolent message is that I can live it personally through a self-sacrificial ethic of walking with Christ to the cross and nobody else has to walk the path. I don't require there to be a law that enforces everybody else to live according to my ethic. I'm willing to self-sacrifice for what I believe in, and that's where it begins and that's where it ends. And all I have to be concerned about is where I'm at with the Lord and being there with Him. In a lot of ways, I see that's kind of where Mormon's getting at here, because he's like, it's not just about giving up your weapons of war, but you've got to give up even that that desire to want to even have to defend yourself. And I know a lot of people who I've talked to are like, well, I don't have guns, be, and I don't even want to kill anybody, but I'm going to kill them to defend my family. And so there's all there's justifications for it. And I'm not here to be able to try to convince anybody of a nonviolent ethic, but the fact is, is that I have lived a reality, and my wife has as well, and I teach our children too where we lay down our weapons and we become self-sacrificial, turning the other cheek, rendering good for evil in every case. We've brought this up in other episodes, and so if anybody wants to leave, we, you know, in our War Chapters episode, if you haven't listened to all of them so far, when we talk about the War Chapters, the very first episode that we did of the War Chapters, Mm -hmm. we talk for the first hour and a half basically on the premise of war and violence, setting the stage for the rest of the War Chapters. So if you're interested in all of that, you know, we don't want to take all the time here, but go back and listen to that. Go back and check that out and to see if there's something there that, that comes up for you, because Section 98 and how that comes about... Even when the Lord commands you that it's okay to defend yourself after the third time, and you refuse to do it and to still turn the other cheek, then it's counted to you as righteousness. And that's powerful. So here when I look at this and I say, you know what, let's at least get rid of our delight in shedding blood. Right. And then at that point, you know what, if God commands you to kill, let's at least get to that standard. When you look at his people and you see the depravity around him, and he sees the chasm between where they're at and like a Zion type people. He's like, all right, I, this chasm, I don't think I can bridge it. Let's bring it down a little bit. <laughs> can you at least get rid of the desire to kill and only do it maybe if God commands you to do it? And so that's kind of what I'm seeing here is, as I, as I, and I, and I love what you'd brought up out there with the punctuation about these not being questions. Cause I, in my head, I read them as questions. It's like, know you not that you're the house of Israel? Know you not that you must, re- you know, that you have to be- repent or you can't be saved? But that's not what he's talking about. These are, these are more command form. Know that you're the house of Israel. Know that you have to have repentance or you can't be saved. Know that you must lay down your weapons. Now, the last thing here, Ben, in verse 3, this really stood out to me, this know that ye must come unto repentance or you cannot be saved. Yeah. This really stood out to me with a lot of things that we've talked about with repentance. Because I think over here in Moroni, Moroni gets into it, but he's a little bit more harsh about it. But when Mormon says, know you that must come into repentance, whenever I see repentance now, I just insert the LDS Bible dictionary definition in my head, and it completely changes the entire point of the whole scripture for me. So when I read this, I say, know that you must come unto a fresh view about God, about oneself, and about the world around you. And man, when I just make that one word change and I just put the definition, insert the LDS Bible dictionary's definition of repentance in there, that already changes everything. Know you that you must have a fresh view about God, about yourself, and about the world around you, or you can't be saved. If you're going to live in a world where you construct your own God, and you live in this vengeful reality where God's a vengeful God and he's coming after you, this goes back to that idea that hell is full of people who think they belong there because they won't repent to see who they already are. They won't repent to be able to see what is already the reality around them, that God is there in love. You know, we've talked about this ad nauseum with like Alma and his repentance process and everything. But I just think that verse three, when I changed that repentance, and I brought in the, just the definition there, that that radically changed the, the whole scripture there for me. It does. I love throwing that in with the word repentance. It just kind of fills it out, just elucidates a whole verse. You're talking about this concept of, especially with verse four and some other places in the scriptures, of there always being like this caveat, right, to the Lord telling you to to put to lay down your, your weapons of war, save it be that God shall command you. And you're talking about how this is providing a path. He were talking about with enemies, he just says, well, there's no enemies. That doesn't that doesn't provide a path from where I am to where 
Christ is, right? That doesn't show me the condescension of God to my understanding and where I am and then showing me the way forward. The invitation is that we act in faith. Mormon throwing in this caveat here is so that people will be able to grow into an understanding. I see that as. And, and just like you were talking about how your personal experience and, and conviction of uh, nonviolence doesn't impose on anybody else this idea or way of living or anything because the way isn't a way of shame. You're not you're not attempting to shame anybody into this um, mindset, <laughs> right? You know, it's it's just like Christ says. It's it's just simply an invitation. It's not an attempt to shame somebody into living or believing in a certain way, according to certain principles. So, like I as I see that, just like you were talking about, you know, to me, it's it's what I, what came to my mind was that it it provides a path right a a path to christ and and that really fits with with everything that he taught and and the way that he lived his life i like here when he talks in verse 5 he's talking about christ and outlining the way and the the atonement and so forth this phrase here and this is used elsewhere in the scriptures he says also in him is the sting of death swallowed up the using the word sting is interesting because like sting is this really sharp, intense pain, right? And as opposed to like more of a dull pain or ache. And I, I say that simply because like death can be this really sorrowful, difficult, mournful occasion, experience for anybody that that has a loved one die or or is just pondering on the concept. It's interesting where he talks about here in terms of symbolism of sting, because that that intense, sharp pain of death itself doesn't have to be when uh, taken in the context of Christ. It's swallowed up, right? Because of the atonement, because of the resurrection. And so while there may still be moaning, or not moaning, mourning, <laughs> might be moaning too, <laughs> but I meant mourning or, you know, sort of pain, you know, there's not this sting, not this intense, sharp pain that is debilitating or, or it doesn't have to be that way. So anyway, just to sort of expand that symbolism there, I, I like how it it treats that. Coming over to verse seven, there's a phrase in here that I'm not sure exactly what Mormon means by this. And it could be just straightforward and I'm and I'm trying to read more into it than there is. But uh, he says here in, in verse seven, he hath brought to pass the redemption of the world, whereby he that is found guiltless before him at the judgment day hath it given unto him to dwell in the presence of God and his kingdom, to sing ceaseless praises with the choirs above unto the Father and unto the Son and unto the Holy Ghost, which are one God, in a state of happiness, which hath no end. I'm wondering about this phrase, a state of happiness. You know, we talked uh, last time about fullness of joy, fullness of sorrow, sacred sadness. I'm wondering how that kind of fits into this concept, a state of happiness, how that sacred sorrow might fit into this. Possibly the way that we can look at this, a state of happiness doesn't mean simply constant jubilation, right? But that it's a condition in which happiness has no limiting factors. And like we talked about last time, I don't think that the experience that God has is one where he's only able to feel happiness in one moment and sadness in another, but that all of these experiences are part of that life. And the more that we come to gain meaning in those we might call them emotions but really they're they're just a human expression of an experience then the more that we come to understand our purpose in life and is to experience what our father has for us to experience in this life just see those as all part of that same state and experience yeah i like that a lot because i think we do a lot of disservice when we think of our eternal rest as basically just kicking up 
you know, on a beach somewhere, somewhere yeah. is like our celestial glories. Like every house has a beach because <laughs> and I don't know how that works <laughs> metaphysically, but. Well, you know, if that's what it is, then okay. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was so great. But, you know, as I said, I live in Bakersfield, California, where the majority of the summer, I don't see a cloud <laughs> after like April. I, and it's always sunny and it's always warm. And the, the, my kids, we have a swimming pool and they live in their swimsuits and, and they like to swim. And that's our life. It's Southern California. You know, it's central, mid south central California, but it's kind of southern ish California. And, and that's our life. And sometimes I'm just bored with it because <laughs> there's like only so much sun. And really, we get into the, this rainy season when, you know, right about now until about the 1st of November, we start to get into these uh, little rainstorms as is very common in a lot of areas, and, and the ones that drop the temperature and all of a sudden, like, suddenly you're in fall, we're about ready to get ours. And I can't tell you how excited I am not to have a sunny day. Like, <laughs> like when I get out there and I, like, see clouds and it's going to start to rain, I keep an app on my phone that has, like, raindrops that are, like, dropping on my phone because I love the rain so much. As much as I love the sun and the joy and the, and the sunny, sunny skies, I love the diversity of having days that are raining. A lot of times I've thought about the gospel and like, you know, if heaven is all about just being happy all the time and at rest all the time, I don't know. And so as we've talked about this and we've, you know, we've brought in, no, it's not what this means. And I'm like, of course, it's not what this means, but that's how we think about it. But the more we see it a new way, it really does contextualize our life here. It brings a lot of extra I don't know if meaning is the right word, but it contextualizes the life that we have that as we live, we are, we're allowed to live in the reality of the now and the present better. When I stop putting all of these fanciful ideas about forever happiness there, the state of happiness, which hath no end. Yeah, I really like what you have to say there because I think that brings in a lot. With verse eight, you know, this goes back to the repentance and the baptism. Repentance and baptism are always together. Like, like you can't have one without the other, especially here. And it's always talking about repent and be baptized, repent and be baptized. And we're going to find a place here just in the next few chapters where Moroni says, we make sure that we're not baptized unworthily. And I know we'll have some stuff to say about that. Hmm. But here in verse eight, therefore repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and lay hold upon the gospel of Christ, which shall be set before you, not only in this record, but also in the record, which shall come unto the Gentiles from the Jews. So repent and be baptized. And for me, this is learn to see God differently. Go out there and have this new experience. Let go of old ideas that you're just are not bringing you joy about the relationship that you have with God. And I know this is so, for, for so many people, this is so scary because we develop such strong narratives about who and what God is and our relationship to God that it is so hard to simply let go and to let God reveal himself as he will. And I, you know, I had a discussion. I think we talked about this in another place. I had a discussion where we talked about, I was talking about being poor in spirit as ego emptying. And my, and uh, I think it was Meister Eckhart who, who had said something to the effect of, we have to even surrender our very idea of God. Highly heretical back in the day, you know, he's, <laughs> he's hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And so what people took him at is, is that we need to doubt the existence of God. That's, that's what people thought yeah. when they heard him say this, like, you need to doubt the existence of God and you need to be able to be skeptical about God, you know, like Descartes and being skeptical about everything. And you need to basically reject your belief in God, all these things. And that had nothing to do with what he was talking about when he said, you have to surrender your very idea of God. What he was talking about is that we build up for ourselves a type of God, and then we live into it. In fact, we see that here in these very chapters, when Moroni is going to be like, if you imagine unto yourselves a God that does not create miracles, then your God is not real. Right. And so even Moroni is talking about these gods we imagine up to ourselves. Well, what if we've imagined up to our, our, ourselves a God that doesn't exist, but we're holding on to it and it's not bringing us happiness. It's not bringing us the good news. It, and we feel empty still. What then? Literally, what then? Are we going to keep on doubling down on the narrative of a God that doesn't have miracles? Because some people do. We literally then at that point have to learn to see God different. And so when I was pressed up against this conversation and someone was saying, well, I I, you know, I've heard about this ego emptying and what have you about uh, letting everything go. 
you know, I, I think that you're giving up the very idea of God is very, is very uh, damaging and is, uh, you know, will lead to apostasy. And I'm like, that's not what I'm talking about at all. We have, uh, John the Baptist came as the forerunner of Christ because their idea of God was not correct. It hadn't been. Ossified. Right. And so they were looking for that Messiah from like Solomon and David and Saul. They were looking for that kind of Messiah to come in, that kind of God to come in. And when Jesus Christ came, he was anything but that. He didn't ride in with horses and chariots and pomp and circumstance and soldiers. He didn't take over everything. He wasn't a political guy. He was a self-sacrificial lamb, and they were looking for a lion. Ironically, when the true lion will come, he'll lay down with the lamb, right? You know, that whole thing is just, it's so fascinating, but... yeah. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent. See God differently. And then when you've had this conversion, and so for me is when I let go of the very idea of God, it's not a matter of skepticism and of doubt. It is a matter of faith. Because when you literally let go of all the things that you've held on to and you simply ask God and say, make yourself manifest, as it were, and you you just empty it all out. God is a kind, benevolent loving God. And his work and glory is to bring to pass our immortality and eternal life. Of course, he's going to be there for us. Of course, he's going to come for us. Of course, we're all the prodigal son and we're all the oldest son. And our father comes running after us after we have gone off into foreign lands and have completely destroyed all of the gifts he's given us. And just like the son where we've remained and did try to be valiant to the letter of the law, and we've never truly understood the love of God. Of course, he's going to be there for each of us. And we forget that over and over again. We believe in this God that we have to qualify for. So repent and be baptized. This baptism, obviously, is the symbolism of being poor in spirit. But I love that because we'll see that a couple extra times here as we're reading through. I like what you were saying about letting go because that fits with laying hold, right? So letting go of the things of the world so that we can lay hold upon the gospel of Christ, like it says here. This seems to go along with the theme of President Nelson was talking about in conference with let God prevail. You know, you were talking about how, you know, let God make himself manifest in your life. And you have to let go of these preconceived notions, these boxes that you've put God in so that you can open your eyes and see him in a new way. And this has to happen every day because... We're constantly, I mean, it just, it's the natural man. And that's why I think that phrase, even in light of what you're talking about with enemies, I think that phrase is particularly interesting. The natural man is an enemy to God, you know, that the natural man naturally sees God as his enemy. There's this constant struggle. The idea is that there's the constant repentance as well, that we're, we're changing our view of who God is. We're letting go of those preconceived notions. We're laying hold on the gospel of Christ. He says, which shall be set before you, not only in this record, but also in the record which shall come unto the Gentiles from the Jews. What are the principal things that are the same between the Book of Mormon and the New Testament? It's primarily the Sermon on the Mount. I mean... There's other stuff, but that is the bulk of what you could say is like almost identical between the two records. I mean, yes, there's a lot of Isaiah, but you know, that's interesting in the context of Christ saying you should read the words of Isaiah, right? Yeah. So Isaiah and Sermon on the Mount, I mean, that those are the things that are word for word the same, almost word for word. There are some fascinating differences, which is a whole nother discussion, but the same between the two records. So I really think it's fascinating where Mormon says here that you're going to have both. He says, this is written for the intent that you may believe that. And if you believe that, you will believe this also. These two witnesses of, of the gospel, you know, just doubling down on the fact of how important these teachings of Christ are to bringing us into an experience with God laying hold upon that gospel of Christ. So just I just love that he kind of points that out to us. Mormon really ends this beautifully. I can't imagine my last words being better than this. <laughs> 
again, ends with inviting people to experience Christ, to be baptized first with water and then with fire and with the Holy Ghost, following the example of our Savior according to that which he hath commanded us. It shall be well with you in the day of judgment. Yeah. Wow. You know, I, I love here that he, he actually talks about the two baptisms. Yeah. You know, because because that baptism, that first baptism, you know, by water, wa- water is always symbolic of the of the chaos, the death, the death, the, the, the destruction, the 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 unorganized fashion of the whole thing, right? So it, it gives it, it's the death of the the natural man, and you come forward of the natural man. And there's at this point, the baptism of fire is now purifying, it's sanctifying. This is cherubim. You killed off the natural man. Now you're prepared to come into the presence, and now there's cherubim here with the flaming sword and this is the moment when now you're letting go of, of all things and you're now being purified. This is the example of our Savior, according to what he hath commanded us. Well, what he what did he command of us? Well, just like you said, it was the, this whole sermon at the temple, the whole sermon on the mount. And and like just like we've said from 3 Nephi 11 and on, you know, Christ gave them his doctrine kind of intellectually. And, you know, he'd given the Beatitudes and then he gave them little vignettes in the Sermon on the Mount about what a Beatitude person was. And they didn't get it. And he's like, I perceive that you don't get this and you're not strong enough to get this yet. He goes, go home. And then he goes to send him home, but he never actually sends him home. Yeah. He's like, he, he like immediately like blesses him. He's like, bring all your sick. So he, he heals everybody. And then he blesses all their children, right? Again, he's bringing everybody into an experience. That whole thing we talked about, I could tell you that you have no enemies, or I can give you the experience. And I like the way you put that, Ben, about the path, about providing the path. He provides this path for us to actually walk. And he's like, you know what? I can just tell you that you don't have enemies, but that's not going to sink in for you. Here, let me give you something that you can actually go out and explore and have an experience with. And it's when they start having the experiences, they can't put words to these things. Then Jesus, he's able to speak a new language that they can't even put words to, and they're having experiences that they can't put words to. And so when it says here to follow the example of our Savior according to that which he hath commanded us, and it shall be well with you, well, with this whole baptism of water and fire, this whole beatitude life of being sanctified and coming back into the presence, and what happens after cherubim? It's it's the tree of life. It's the love of God. You know, I was having a conversation the other day where it's like, I, I'm getting to a place where, you know, there's two trees that I can eat from every day. I can eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, which is delicious and is very desirable, and I can eat it. And I'm like, yeah, it really fills my ego and it makes me feel good and empowered. It makes me feel like I'm actually making headway to be able to know, have more knowledge of what's good and what's bad and to be able to kind of build my, myself up with knowledge and everything. But man, I've got to go through cherubim. And the whole purifying, the sanctifying, and the cutting away before I can get to the love of God. And doggone it, that's painful sometimes. Because i got to let go. I've got to surrender. And so every day I'm here at the two trees, and I've got fruit in two hands. And I'm like, what fruit am I going to eat today? And I'm just getting tired of eating the same fruit over and over and over again. Because at the end of the day, I just want to live and experience the love of God. I've looked for it, Ben. It's back in it's back in Helaman. I didn't have time to go back and, and pull it up though. But it's uh, it's a, one of these scriptures that that corresponds and it brings. And I think it was when we were recording with Christopher. It may have been the episode we didn't air, which mm-hmm. is uh, which is sad. But there's this uh, one verse that talks about, and it combines the two allegories of the tree of life with cherubim and that sword and the flame, that sword of fire and the flaming sword and purifying sword with with the rod. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's it's making symbolism, it's making synonymous cherubim with the iron rod. Because I've often wondered, I'm like, man, where's cherubim yeah. in the in Lehi's dream? Like, did he like take a vacation? <laughs> like, right, like, right. Where did he why go? Is it so, so different, right? Yeah, why is it so different? So unless like unless it's there's more than one tree, you know, like two Kimura theory or whatever. But it's so unless there's like a two tree theory. And Lehi is not at that one tree of life. You know, I'm giving that there's just the one tree of life. So then where's cherubim? Well, the fact is, in this case, it's the word of God. And so just like you said, we have to surrender the natural man. So then we grasp onto and we hold on to the word of God. That's just a completely different experience. Wow. So like, I just uh, I had a whole thought process. So you were talking about that in terms of the symbolism of the Lehi's vision and the cherubim and flaming sword, and then what Alma talks about when he talks about the cherubim was placed there because he's responding to what his son Corianton is thinking about. There's also a discussion about it back in the Ammonihah chapters 
this makes a whole lot more sense to me now after you were talking about that. And I feel like there's a whole way we could go with that, but that is totally tangential to <laughs> these <laughs> these chapters here. But um, I need to explore that because there's something really fascinating there about the rod being the way and the cherubim turns every way, lest Adam and Eve partake of it and live forever in their sin. Well, then the cherubim isn't keeping you away. It's actually the way back. Yeah. And that's just, that's so interesting to me, but we need to, we probably need to go to chapter eight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before chapter eight, I finally found the scripture in Helaman that I was talking about. Yeah. But it's Helaman 329. And it says, yea, we see that whosoever will lay hold upon the word of God. Yes. All right. So that gives us the word of God as the iron rod, right? That, you know, mm -hmm. that's the thing that we're grasping hold, which is quick and powerful, which shall divide asunder all the cunning and snares and the wiles of the devil and lead a man to Christ in the straight and narrow course across the everlasting gulf of misery, which is prepared and engulfed by the wicked. Yeah. And the divide asunder is the two-edged sword. It talks about in the Doctrine and Covenants all the time. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so cherubim, for me to get back to the love of God, cherubim's not trying to keep me out. He's there to help me come back in. In fact, in a lot of the symbolism, the sword is actually coming out of the mouth of the cherubim because it's his tongue. And what is the tongue? Well, it's speaking. What does Nephi say? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. So it's all it's all wrapped up in that symbolism. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just great. We stuff. could we could just do a whole nother <laughs> podcast on that. That's so fascinating. <laughs> all right. Let me turn back here to Mormon. Okay, so I'm back here to Mormon. We uh let's see here, where do we leave off at? Well, chapter eight. So this is Moroni taking over of the writing, you know, just like we said. He he talks about uh, how his father's killed, uh, there was the great battle, um, and he's left alone. And he says, I will write and hide up the records in the earth, and whither I go, it mattereth not. So like I was saying before, I, I really do think his intention was to finish writing these few little things, and then to go ahead and bury the plates, wander off into the sunset. He says here in verse 5, My father hath made this record, and he hath written the intent thereof. I think that's interesting, because going back to verses 8 and 9 of chapter 7, what does Mormon say about the intent? He says, this is written for the intent that you may believe that. Well, what's he talking about? The gospel of Jesus Christ, just like we talked about in terms of like the Sermon on the Mount. And then Moroni says something interesting here. He says, and behold, I would write it also if I had room upon the plates. Man, I would just repeat the whole the whole Sermon on the Mount to you, the whole Sermon at the Temple to you, if I had room. I'd just write it all over again, because that's the good stuff. <laughs> I, I think that's interesting. He's like, but I don't have room for all of that. So I'm going to go on for a bunch more pages. He seems to, he says, but I have not, and or I have none, for I am alone. He implies that he doesn't have room. So I'm not sure how he fit in ether. It's possible that he just took the plates, literally, and then put them with it. So he might not have needed to make more plates. Somehow he was able to fit Moroni 1 through 10 still on whatever plates he had. Maybe he found a little bit to do that with. I'm not sure. When he says he's basically out of room, but he then still has room to do the rest. I'm not sure what exactly is going on here. Yeah, I haven't made sense of that either. I know there's books that have talked about it. I know there's some scholars that have talked about it. I'm pretty close to getting into some of the research myself about how the Book of Mormon was laid out and how they think it came about and, and how it was stacked in the in the actual – because there uh -huh. are some theories oh, yeah. that have come out about how, how the whole Book of Mormon was laid out. I just haven't gotten into that yet. Yeah. Well, there's something interesting there that could deal with some research from somebody who probably has a lot firmer grasp on uh, some of these concepts than than me or you – so we'll let them do that and then <laughs> we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll watch their YouTube videos or read their papers. That's right. And and we'll post it when we find it. In verse 7, you know, we had talked in about 7 and 8 and just before recording, but it, it says and behold the Lamanites have hunted down my people, the Nephites down from city to city, from place to place, even until they are no more. I feel like I should have said that a lot more like solemnly. But hmm. and great has been their fall, yea, and great and marvelous is the destruction of my people, the Nephites. And then here in verse the, verse 8, this is the interesting part. And behold, it is the hand of the Lord which hath done it. This is an interesting way of writing this because we know back in Mormon chapter 4, verse 5, the Lord says it's the by the wicked that the wicked are destroyed. But here it's talking about the hand of the Lord. 
There's one idea that I had about it, and Ben, I don't know if you have any other ideas as well. It gets into the idea, there's this book by Brad Jersak, Bradley Jersak, and he talks about the wrath of God a lot. And he gets into some, and he's he's a Christian author, so he's using the Bible for it. And the wrath of God appears a lot in the Bible, as it does in the Book of Mormon. And he goes in, and he has a really persuasive way of being able to show that the wrath of God is not this proactive anger from God, where God's coming out to destroy, but it's that God is allowing reality to be reality. He's allowing us to receive the consequences of our actions. That that's God's wrath. He's not the proactive, vengeful, destructive person. He's just the person who's allowing it to happen. He's he's not going to stop it. He's not going to uh, infringe upon that. And so when I look at this as the hand of the Lord, which hath done it, I see the hand of God moving where he's always there to bless his children. So I don't look at this as like the proactive hand of God that God, I mean, because that doesn't even make any sense. If we believe in an embodied God, it's not like God came down as the warrior and started killing everybody. And so it's like, or did God orchestrate it? I'm like, well, how would God even come down and like whisper into like someone's ear? Like, you need to go kill that guy. He's like, all right. And because he's wicked, he goes like, how does that even happen? When we look at this as by the hand of the Lord, which is done, I see this as more of that wrathful God concept that God is, is allowing reality to be what reality is. He's allowing people to live according to their reality. Because we know also, we talked about last episode that Mormon has, re, I mean, he went out to preach the word of God again. And like nobody listened. And like God told tells him, go out to preach, go out to preach repentance again, and he does it. And nobody listens. I loved that you know the idea that you brought up that maybe someone like an Alma the Younger did listen. Maybe like one person was converted there, but we don't have that in the record. Regardless, it's either God looking out for the one that will listen, or He's still sending a message out and like an olive branch out, even though He may know otherwise. But He's still actively there for us, and so I don't see this actively engaged God coming out with his hand to like just swipe the playing field with it. Like he's playing a game of risk and he's losing. And so he just gets mad and like wipes the board with it. He's like, <laughs> just throws the board. <laughs> he's like, screw Australia. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's not the way this works. And so, yeah, I, I don't think that's a very confusing verse when we kind of see it in a broader context. And then again in verse 10, and there are none that do know the true God, save it be the disciples of Jesus. I love this true God. He brings in the true God. This goes back to repentance. Mm -hmm. They may have been believing in God, right? Even in chapter four, when it says that it was a chapter four or chapter two, where they were coming back to God and they were trying to repent. And he's like, I saw that this was in vain, that, that they were not there. It was chapter two, that their mourning and their lamentation was not unto a repentant heart, but they would rather curse God and wish to die that they wanted. Their mourning was basically not the beatitude type of mourning, but the sinful mourning. They weren't looking to the true God. Mormon knew the true God. He knew the merciful extension, long suffering, true God, but they weren't following that God. And so I love that Moroni here brings in that that qualifier, that they don't know the true God, hence the need to repent. They need to see God differently in themselves. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing in terms of this is just a statement of reality. It's almost like Moroni consigning himself. It's great and marvelous. It's almost like he's saying, but this is the way it is. And I wonder if it's maybe an idiomatic expression that might not have translated well. We do know that the Nephite narrative was always that if there was a war or destruction, it was the judgments of God upon them. It's possible that that was so ingrained in that Nephite culture and narrative that it turned into some something like an idiomatic expression, which didn't translate well. Now, I, that's a difficult thing to say because when we're talking about Joseph Smith translating by the gift and power of God, he didn't just translate word for word or whatever. He also translated the meaning and the intent. There's a whole lot that we can read into this statement here. Again, the Nephite narrative being that when there's destruction among them, it's the judgments of God upon them. So when we say, you know, behold, it is the hand of the Lord which hath done it, this might be akin to us just saying, he says just previously, great and marvelous is the destruction of my people, the Nephites, but that's just the way it is. That's just what happened. You know, even though it incredible to me, I have a hard time grasping and believing this, but it is reality. It is what happened. So it, that's one thought I had on on what this phrase might mean, you know, why he would insert that, because it does seem a little contradictory. Verse 7 says it's the Lamanites that did it. And then he comes back and says the Lord did it. So verse 7 says the Lamanites did it. Mormon 4 verse 5 says it's the wicked that uh, destroy the wicked. Um, and then here saying the Lord did it. I think there's got to be a broader context understanding to that. 
to that verse. And, and I think it is along the lines of what you were talking about, basically just more, uh, Moroni stating this is reality. This is what happened. Not with, you know, even though it's hard for me to believe because it's great and marvelous is what he calls it. Yeah, I think that's even borne out on the next page over in verses uh, 17 and 19 and they get basically through 21. But it said, if there be false, he's talking about the, so now Moroni is talking about the Book of Mormon. And he's talking about the coming forward of the Book of Mormon and about how it, you know it will have to come through with the glory of God and with the power of God because he's going to basically Moroni's like, listen, I'm going to bury this record in the earth in a random hill, <laughs> in a random hill, in some random place. I'm just going to sink him here in the earth, and it's got a language that nobody knows. I know it. Nobody else knows it. We've changed it. There's not going to be a dictionary next to it, and it's going to have to come from God. So, but then he says. And if there be faults, basically faults in the record, then they are the faults of man. But behold, we know no fault. Nevertheless, God knoweth all things. Therefore, he that condemneth, let them be aware that he shall be in danger of hell fire. Okay, <laughs> let's back up a sec. When I read this as a child, I'm like, if I don't believe in the Book of Mormon, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to burn for. I'm going to burn in hell. I'm going to burn in hell. Yeah. <laughs> this is much different. So this this hell again. I've come to a belief that. The celestial and terrestrial and celestial and, and kingdoms and hell and outer, that these are matters of perception, that they are far, far more matters of perception than they are physical realities. That if we were to literally be able to pull back, like Paul says, but we see through a glass darkly. And if we were able to pull back the eyes of our natural man, we would see what he already is. Like, there's a reality around us that I'm just not seeing. And if I were to pull back the lens, I would see it. In that, I'm always already worthy. And that's where that conversation comes in. But the fact is that I'm not. So I've got to see God differently than I see him now, which means that because I'm always already worthy and I don't perceive that already, and I perceive that I'm, I act against that worthiness that I already am, that's my sin. And I do sin and I need a savior to show me the way and I need to repent. And so when I see these things that if I don't come into an awareness with God, just like the Nephites here, I damn myself. We literally damn ourselves if we refuse to see God differently, because when we see God differently, we see ourselves differently. And if we don't see ourselves differently, then we're always going to be in the same natural man, self-repeating cycle for the, our whole lives quite frankly, I don't want to live that life. Yeah, it's that hellish experience. Right. That's what he's saying. That's what hellfire is. It's, a, it's literally it's hell. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> That's the hellfire. He's like, listen, if you don't want to come into this relationship with God and you just want to condemn and you want to pick faults with everybody or else, you're going to damn yourself because you're not letting go. And thus it is, you know, people that live a critical life that are constantly critical of others. That's the reality they live in. It's a critical reality. It's hell. Yeah. I mean, literally, it's it's a literal hell. And in verse 19 here, where it says, For behold, the same that judgeth rashly shall be judged rashly again. Mm -hmm. And again, when I was a young child, I thought this meant, oh, well, if I, if I go out and if I judge someone, then God's going to judge me that way. And as I've gotten older, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense that I, I did something wrong to somebody else. And so God's going to treat me that way. And that that's going to be like, well, okay, well, you know, you kicked a little puppy, so now I'm going to kick you. And I'm like, that's that eye for an eye, what Cain thought, right? That's that Cain narrative that I killed Abel, now they're going to kill me back. And God's like, literally didn't say that, Cain. Like, I'm here to reconcile with you, literally didn't say that. And so when I look at this, that the same that judgeth rashly shall be judged rashly again, that's why I think this is a matter of perception, because what we throw out there is what comes back to us. And if this is what's happening, it's not that God's doing this back to us, it's that we live in a reality where we're throwing this out into the world and it's coming back to us and we're just projecting ourselves and then we're living into that reality over and over and over and over again until we finally stop and say, listen, I don't want to live this life anymore. There's some, there's got to be something else. I've got to let go of whatever this is. And I know from personal experience, and I know every, every single person I've ever talked to about this, it's difficult because if we could identify that one thing in our lives that is making us go into these self-repeating cycles of destruction, it's like, I would change that thing. But there's no user handbook for this life in a lot of ways. And there's no like simple, like going down into the code of our being and being able to like, I'm going to change that code and take that virus out and then like fix my, my system. It does. It's a lot of that. It just doesn't work like that. 
Yeah. When we sit down here and we have verses like this, I think in a lot of ways, I saw God as this vengeful God who's like, all right, you did this. I'm going to do it back to you. And as a parent, I tried to do that once or twice. If you do this, whatever you do to them, I'll do to you. And man, I, I remember saying that. I did it twice as a, as a father. And man, I felt dirty both times I said it. Because I was like, what, what kind of incentive is that? How does that make you better? How does that make <laughs> yeah. me better, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like I, I have to be the person now who does the bad thing that you did to somebody else. I'm like, that's just that just doesn't make any sense. And right. so I've abandoned that way of thinking. And largely, this is just the reality that we live into. That's how I see that now. That's the way I see this next verse too. You know, there's at least two different ways of seeing this. And I think when we are in a repentant state and seeing God for who truly is, verse 20 really looks different. Behold what the scripture says, man shall not smite, neither shall he judge. For judgment is mine, saith the Lord, and vengeance is mine also, and I will repay. Well, goodness, like, you could look at this and say, okay, so God gets to smite people, he's going to smite people, and he's going to condemn them with his judgment, and he's going to use vengeance upon them, and he will repay, right? You know, you're going to get punished. But this could also be completely different. And it just all depends, like you say sometimes, on how you view God. Rather here, man shall not smite neither shall he judge, for judgment is mine. Because man's judgment is not true judgment. It's not real justice. It's what we think is justice. The Lord says, judgment is mine. You don't get it. You don't understand it. You can't even do it right. <laughs> you're, you're doing it all wrong. So don't try, because you're not going to get that right. You're not going to get it right until you change your view of who you are, who I am, and who your your supposed enemies are, what the world is. Vengeance is mine. I have total ownership of that. You can't really use that concept in a way that affects reality. It's not going to get you anywhere. And I will repay. You know, that that's so interesting in terms of how the Lord is going to grant his blessings. You know, Christ says in his teachings that the father seeks to bless all of his children. He causes it to rain on the just and the unjust alike. His blessings are on all of his children. Our privilege and, and pleasure when we repent to see and view those blessings that he gives to us, not necessarily that we're conditional the blessings themselves upon our actions, but are viewing them and understanding them and knowing them and taking satisfaction and joy in them is contingent upon that. Yeah, I when you were saying this here about uh, 20 and 21, the Lord will pour out his, you know, the vengeance that he will repay. It reminds me of back in 3rd Defi where it, Christ says basically, judge as I have judged and the whoremonger and the adulterer and, and the thief, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And I stopped to think, I'm like, okay, well, how did Christ, how did Christ deal with that? And the woman taken in adultery came to mind. And I was like, wow, treat each other as I have done it. J judge as I have judged. And like, how did this happen? When he comes up to me, he's like, woman, where are your accusers? He dismissed all the accusers. That's how he judged. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> all the accusers. He's like, you can be dismissed now. It's like, I will dismiss you now without any other question. You leave. And then he turns to her and he's, and then he's like, where are the accusers? Where is Satan here? Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, man. He's like, neither do I condemn you. Go thy way and sin no more. Now he's not, he's not here to tell her to be saved in her sin, but he's also not there to condemn her. Right. And so it's this beautiful balance of having this advocate for you who is tapping into your inner humanity and encouraging you without shame and without without any of these other tactics that we love as human beings to inflict upon people who we think have done bad things. And he simply and he gets rid of the entire accusation mindset. Man, I can't say how powerful that was for me, and it's still so powerful just by making the connection that Satan literally means accuser. That whenever I see that accusation, that finger pointing, that that spirit that's within myself 
I mean, that Satan, that voice has done more damage in my life. The accuser that makes me point fingers outward and the finger that makes me accuse and point fingers inward. That is the most damning voice ever. It's the one that creates all the shame. It's the one that creates all the anxiety. It's the one that creates all the panic. It's the one that creates everything. And yet it's the Christ that comes along as the deliverer, as the one to reconcile us with God, the one to reconcile us with reality, the one that tells us, take no thought for the morrow, which in the actual words is, take no anxiety for tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. There's enough today just to deal with today. Let's just deal with today. I'm here with you today. I see this, that God's going to come down with his judgment and his vengeance. I'm like, I like God's judgments and vengeance when that woman in adultery situation, man, I can tell you can't be in that situation where that she was in without feeling pain. He looked at Cain and he's, he told Cain, he even warned Cain beforehand. He's like, Hey, listen, I'm warning you sins coming. It wants to come after you. And then once Cain was susceptible to it, he, he heard the warning, and he still did it anyway. And there's pain there, and he came to reconcile the pain even then. We have to realize that that living outside of reality, that the living in a world where we don't recognize the love of God that is always already there, is painful. And he recognizes that we live in that reality, and he's always there to help us. (laughs) And we fight fight against it. That's the, that just, just, that just blows my, I fight against it, Ben. I fight against that essence of always already being loved and of already being worthy and already being, I I literally fight. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, that can't possibly be because of X, Y, and Z and and all these other things that I can justify to be able to show how I'm wrong. I refuse to live in it. And, And this goes back to what we're saying about Christ saying, love your enemies versus just saying you have no enemies. That it, there's one thing to be able to say something is true. And there's another thing entirely about living it. But I know that the times I've lived it, it's completely and radically changed my life. That goes along with what I was thinking about with verse 24 here. He says, He knoweth their prayers, that they were in behalf of their brethren, and he knoweth their faith. For in his name could they remove mountains, and in his name could they cause the earth to shake. And by the power of his word did they cause prisons to tumble to the earth, yea, even the fiery furnace could not harm them. Neither wild beasts nor poisonous serpents because of the power of his word. That last time we talked about the three Nephites and how they weren't uh, subject to all of these sorts of things. And there's different ways of viewing that. Um, you brought up the thought that in terms of them not being able to to be harmed by these, certainly there could be some sort of a uh, supernatural thing going on where they physically can't be harmed by fire, you know, something that would seem supernatural or miraculous to us. In this context um, here, though, I I think that it doesn't have to mean that for it to be true. And I I submit the example of of Ammonihah or of the Anti-Nephi-Lehi's or of Abinadi as evidence for this, because they were not harmed in any eternal or spiritual sense by these things. And what came of those, especially like Abinadi's or the Anti-Nephi-Lehi's, what came of that was actually mass conversion of more people to the way to Christ. And why? Because of the power of his word, it says there at the end of that verse. So I, I see this... There's some literalness to this. I'm not discounting that, but I see the more profound meaning of this being that the way of Christ is the miracle in and of itself, regardless of some temporal physical outcome that we see, whether whether someone is actually harmed physically by these things. The real harm never comes to bear in terms of spiritual sense. Yeah, that goes back to some of the stuff that uh, we've talked about before where we talk about how bad things will still happen, but there's no fear in it. There's literally taken all the fear. It's taken, it's taken the whole punch out of it. Yeah. And, and, and so there's just, there's nothing but freedom and liberation in those moments. You know, as we turn to verses 29 and 30 and 31, we, Moroni turns his, his view and his gaze towards the coming forward of the Book of Mormon when he realizes these plates are going to be discovered again. 
He talks about the, how they're going to be coming forward in days and ages of fires and tempests and vapors of smoke and wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pollutions, murders, robbings, lyings, deceivings, whoredoms. <laughs> Sounds like a horrible time to come forward. It's like, man, I don't want to live in that day. Seems to be a pretty common sort of, what is it, this, uh, I don't know if it's a literary device or common uh, practice here where in the scriptures they start listing like all of these awful things and sins and stuff, whereas they they could just, you know, if they're running out of space, they could just say all manner of wickedness, right? <laughs> <laughs> and to make it concise. Maybe these were much smaller words in their language than they are in ours. <laughs> See, I'm not, I, uh, brevity is not my strong suit. I mean, if, if I can take 20 words to what I could say in three. If anybody is friends with Shadow Logan <laughs> on social media, they know that brevity <laughs> is not. It's not my strength, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I will take 50 words to explain what I could, I could have said better in 10. But in this, I'm like, yeah, my brother is like, let's take up some more verses to be able to pontificate. Let's do that. But here in, uh, you know, pollutions, you'd looked up the 1828 definition in the Webster's Dictionary, and pollutions in that dictionary doesn't mean what it does now. Like, we think of physical pollutions and, like, you know, pollution and we're polluting the environment. These pollutions are spiritual in nature. And in fact, that even bears out in the next page over in verse 38 when it says, O ye pollutions, ye hypocrites, ye teachers, you sell yourselves for that which will canker and have polluted the holy church of God. So there we have the you know, pollutions as a as a matter of like the the spiritual self, as it were. But I was thinking about a few things here in the end of verses thirty one in chapter eight, verse thirty one, where it says that basically the Book of Mormon will come in when there will be many which will say, "Do this or do that," and it mattereth not, for the Lord will uphold such at the last day. But woe unto such, for they are in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. And so this scripture was quoted to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. In response to a couple discussions that I've been having about this whole always already worthy thing. Oh. And it still just, it still wasn't landing you know, what was being communicated. You know, I, I take responsibility if I, you know, for, for what I wasn't able to communicate. But this is definitely not what we're talking about. So when we talk about this always being already worthy, it's not that it's a libertine lifestyle. It's not a rejection of repentance. No, <laughs> it's the call to repent. <laughs> It's right. literally the call to repent. It's literally the call to forsake sin. It's the call to forsake that which is not. It's exactly the opposite of this. So it's not do this or do that and and just do everybody will be saved. Just do whatever you want to do and everybody will be saved. No, it's the whole point is for us to learn how to be in the awe in the presence of God. Go into the celestial room and in our temple worship and we get into the celestial. There's no instruction there. There's no lessons. It'd be weird if there was. No, we get into that that space and we just contemplate. It's a space of contemplation. It's a space of just being there with God in, in the awe and the majesty and the silence and the and the reverence of God. And that's what this is. So it's not do whatever you want and God's going to save you. It's God is always going to be coming after us to save us. And now, I don't know what the end result of that's going to be, but God is always coming after us. He's always going to be there for us. And in this regard, it's not that don't do anything, it doesn't matter. Yes, we are always in the presence of God, but God is always wanting us like the prodigal son to return, and he's always going to be running for us. And it's in that return where we finally surrender, where we're able to give up the pain of this life and all the pains that that come along. And then at that point, it's not to say that it's the pain of ego, it's the pain of sin. It's not to say that there is no, you know, this gets back to the, you know, the discussion, you brought it up again, the sacred sadness. It's not that. It's that w- the pain that comes from sin, basically the, the Mormon two people, the ones who want God to let them to be happy in their sin, mm-hmm. we forsake that. Right. right. So as we turn from uh, um, chapter tw- or chapter eight, unless you have anything else that you want to talk about uh, chapter eight on? Well, you know, he makes all these really pointed accusations at not just the world. He's talking to the church here. We need to, I think we need to take a lot of this to heart and really consider this because, uh, you know, this reminds me a little bit of Alma chapter four, where Alma basically just rips into the church, (laughs) or I guess this is Mormon's commentary on what's going on with the members of the church, that they are more prideful than the people who aren't members of the church. And it's causing huge problems 
Um, so more, you know, Alma goes out and preaching and, and I see Mormon here, sorry, Moroni here basically telling us, Hey, you know, just because you belong to the church of Christ doesn't mean you can't be more wicked than the people who don't. Don't think that gives you some special badge of righteousness necessarily. You have to actually follow Christ. Just belonging to his church doesn't doesn't do it. And so I see his message to us as really pretty stark. I highlighted verse 36, you do walk in the pride of your hearts. And this reminds me of Alma chapter 5. It's these Lord is it I questions. Like I was reading through this and I was thinking, I kind of do that. Oh, I kind of do that. You know what? I kind of do that. That kind of is me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and and so, uh, you know, we like to look at this. We'd like to read through this and be like, man, you know, some people are just so wicked. <laughs> and it's like, no, I am so <laughs> wicked. Uh, a lot of this stuff can apply to me and, and, I, and I need to recognize that so that I can not be deluding myself about my spiritual state so that I can really destroy whatever false image I have of, of God that's allowing me to, to ignore these sins and these iniquities and rather let them go and see God in a new way. Because it's all part of that. Those false gods that we build up all have these, these they blind us to these types of iniquities in ourselves. And, and God doesn't do that. He doesn't blind us to our own iniquity, but he doesn't shame us about it either. He simply presents it to us, like, like you said, with, with the example of Christ and adulterer. He didn't say she wasn't an adulterer. He just didn't condemn her for it and instead invited her to sin no more. I mean, how we've brought that example up just a million times now, but just how beautiful is that? How different is that from the way the world wants to teach you to change? The world wants to teach you to change in a, in a totally different way from that. And we have that just so pounded into our minds through, through traditions and culture and education and whatever. It's so difficult to get over and get rid of. I just see Moroni's going over this as almost in some way, uh, kind of an Alma chapter five, hey, Really examine yourself. You guys are supposed to be part of the Church of Christ. You can't. You can't let these things be part of who you are. What you said there about the wicked. No, the wicked never identify as the wicked, right? Right. <laughs> it's it's always somebody right. else. In fact, I uh, because of our discussion about uh, about Satan and Third uh, Nephi nine through nine through ten, I went out and bought a bunch of books on the origin, uh, the intellectual history of Satan, and where that idea came from. And there's this one by Elaine Pagels that I came across that was just absolutely fascinating, who talks about how the most comprehensive ideas about that we have about Satan has happened because of collective identity in juxta in how it contrasts with other collective identity and how that we demonize the other. Mm -hmm. Satan's always the other. Yeah. So, yeah, Satan's always the other, right? It's always the one that's accusing the other one. Basically, generation one will accuse its enemy of being X, Y, and Z. And all of a sudden it's those X, Y, and Z qualities that become their, their collective con uh, idea of Satan. And they pass that on to the next generation. Well, that next generation takes those ideas and then they have a different experience with their enemies. And now you add those ideas into what it is to be Satan. Wow. How is that not the Defites and Lamanites? Right? Exactly right. It just, and so as one generation passes to the next, they end up building this idea about what Satan is basically on how they view the other person. Huh. And so the other person's always the wickedest, never yourself. And I know I, I brought this up before, but it was a really powerful experience. It happened to me over the, and it happened just like, I mean, it was like a 30 second experience that I, if I, and a lot of the times these experiences happen for me in that I have like these, what I call glimpses. And I use that word a lot and I almost have to go back into them. Like I have to like, wait, wait, what, what was that? And, and I have to stop and like go back into it. And one of these experiences is I just started to play the last supper story in my head. And just kind of mentally seeing this whole thing unfold and where Christ says, surely one of you is about to betray me. And in one by one, each one of the, the disciples or the apostles came up and said, Lord, is it I? 
And that struck me in a way that has never struck me before about this wickedness and about the emptying and the sermon, you know, this whole beatitude emptying. In that you take these men who are not Judas, who don't have any context to being one who would deny Christ, that they love him. They're there with him. They're enjoying him. They don't want to be anywhere else but with him. And yet when he says, one of you is about to betray me, unlike Peter, who previously is like, I'll I'll do anything and I'll defend you to to the death. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. In this moment, everyone humbles themselves and they literally just come to Christ in this context. Like, I can't even see how it could be me. I can't even see there's nothing in me that it would do this. I, I can't even have context to this. But yet one by one, each of them asked. Lord, is, is is it I? And for me, that moment just unfolded into this, just this beautiful scene of these disciples willingly to surrender so deeply into asking God, Jesus, I have nothing that I could possibly think I would deny you or to do this or betray you. But if you say so, is it me? And just that intimate moment of verses of the wickedness that we portray. And so when you said that, I, I was, it brought me back to that. Yeah, I, I see myself in a lot of this too. Um, I don't want to. <laughs> it's it's, ne- <laughs> it's Not never fun. To. It's it's uncomfortable. It's never fun to. Mm-hmm. But you know, in you know, in turning the in turning the page here and into uh, into chapter nine. Moroni, you said it too, Ben. These weren't in chapters when Moroni wrote. This was all one message. So if you read this, read this as just one address. But he gets in here to mm-hmm. verse 9, and now he's addressing those who don't believe in Christ. And this just, I, I laughed out loud. In fact, I even put laughing marks on the yeah, side. Yeah, I've always I'm laughed like, at this a little bit too. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm just going to read it. And he goes on for like six, or from verse 2 to verse 6 in chapter 9. Behold. Will ye believe in the day of your visitation? Behold, when the Lord shall come, yea, even that great day when the earth shall be rolled together as a scroll, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and in the great day that ye shall be brought to stand before the Lamb of God, then will ye shall say there is no God? <laughs> You're like, okay, all right, all right, Moroni. <laughs> I, I get where this is where I think his passion has to be coming from some kind of experience that he had that he hasn't told us about. There had to be some kind of like fourth century Facebook conversation that he was having with someone who didn't believe in God. <laughs> and he's like, that guy's dead. So I can't argue with him anymore, but I'm going to do it here. I'm going to do it here. <laughs> Then will you longer deny Christ, or can you behold the Lamb of God? Do you suppose that you shall dwell with him with under a consciousness of your guilt? Do you suppose that you should be happy to dwell with that holy being when your souls are racked with the consciousness of guilt that you have you have ever abused his laws? Behold, I say unto you that you would be more miserable to dwell with a holy and a just God under a consciousness of your filthiness before him than you would to dwell with the damned souls in hell. For behold, when you shall be brought to see your nakedness before God and also the glory of God and the holiness of Jesus Christ, it will kindle a flame of unquenchable fire upon you. I've had some Facebook conversations that have kind of gone like this. He says, Oh, then ye unbelieving, turn unto the Lord, cry mightily unto the Father in the name of Jesus, that perhaps you may be found spotless, pure, fair, white, having been cleansed from the blood of the Lamb on the great and last day. Now, ultimately, very beautiful, but in this particular context, I very much see Moroni's passion coming out. I see this whole, almost like a frustration of of, uh, exacerbation, I like the word you used before, of just the context in the world around him. I'm sure he's argued with many people. I'm sure he's had these conversations ad nauseum with people. He's the only one I'm, I'm sure who's believed like his father. And in this, you can see how he might be going just a little bit beyond where he he really should, I think. Because even though the wicked who have not repented and seen God differently will be harrowed up with a consciousness of their guilt because they see themselves in a guilty, non-worthy way. Even though they will stand before God being in the light. You know, it, for, for me, that phrase that the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not is very fitting here. It's that we are surrounded by light, but yet we have those lenses that Paul talks about. We see through the glass darkly. 
And in this, we we do. We damn ourselves. We see through our own egos. We see through our own lens. We see through our own persona. We refuse to see God the way God is. And in that, yeah, that, that's, that's a living hell, as we've talked about. Maybe that's what Moroni is thinking. Maybe Moroni really feels that we would normally read this, <laughs> that they're going to be physically cast down into this hell. I don't know. I would love to have a conversation with Moroni and kind of have a come to Jesus moment with Moroni in the literal sense. But then he gets into talking about the denying the revelations of God. And from that, we springboard into, he brings in the resurrection in verse 13. Mm -hmm. And because of the redemption of man, which came by Jesus Christ, they are brought back into the presence of the Lord. Yea, this is wherein all men are redeemed because the death of Christ bringeth to pass the resurrection which bringeth to pass a redemption from an endless sleep, from which sleep all men shall be awakened by the power of God when the trump shall sound, and they shall come forth, both small and great, and shall stand before the bar, being redeemed and loosed from the eternal band of death, which death is a temporal death. And again, repeating what Mormon talked about in chapter 8, this resurrection of the dead, I can see just how important that is, especially in Mormon and Moroni's context of their entire lives are spent in the destruction of their people. We talked about verse 10 already, but I want to bring it in and then go over to verse 15. And now, if ye have imagined up unto yourselves a God who doth vary, and in whom there is a shadow of changing, then have ye imagined up unto yourselves a God who is not a God of miracles. But behold, I will show unto you a God of miracles. We were talking before about all the things that uh, he says The prisons would tumble, the fiery furnace couldn't hurt them, poisonous serpents couldn't hurt them because of the power of the word of God. I think in terms of miracles here, we can see there's a lot of these like outwardly visible miracles. Ultimately, each of us has to concede that the greatest miracle we're going to experience in our life is when our hearts change and we see God in a new way and we see everything else in a new way, that repentance, that miracle of repentance. I see that here where he goes into his discussion of a God of miracles. This is calling after the sinner, you know, that that views God in a vengeful way and saying, no, God is a God of miracles. You're not too far gone. You are never lost. He's always coming after to find you. What does Christ say to his, the people He says, now I go to the lost tribes of Israel, but they're not lost to the Father. I just, I love that phrase there, that statement, that none of us are lost to him. He knows where we are, and he'll come after us to find us. So I'm going to go over to verse 15. And now, O all ye that have imagined up unto yourselves a God who can do no miracles, think, all ye that have imagined up unto yourselves a God who who cannot forgive you. I would ask of you, have all these things passed of which I have spoken? Has the end come yet? Behold, I say unto you, nay, and God has not ceased to be a God of miracles. Are you dead yet? Are you condemned to hell for eternity yet? (laughs) No, you're not. And God can still do miracles in your life. It's not over. Your day of repentance is not past. It can still be. It can be today. So I see Moroni calling us to that. Behold, are not the things that God hath wrought marvelous in our eyes? Yea, and who can comprehend the marvelous works of God? This reminds me of of Enos when Enos receives forgiveness. And then his next question is, how? How's it done? Like he just experienced this miracle and it amazed him. It blew him away. It was so amazing. He could didn't have words for it. How? How is this possible? And the response, because of your faith in Christ. To me, it's what this spoke of this time as I read through this, that miracle of forgiveness, of us changing our view of God. Again, this repentance that we're constantly coming back to. We turn the page, we get to verses 20 and 21. And the reason why he ceases to do miracles, might I add in here, the reason why we perceive that he ceaseth to do miracles among the children of men is because that they dwindle in unbelief and depart from the right way and know not the God in whom they should trust. Right? 
they depart from a knowledge and an understanding and a perception of reality and God. And so they don't see the miracles. They don't see them. It seems to them as if they don't exist. Behold, I say unto you that whoso believeth in Christ, doubting nothing, whatsoever he shall ask the Father in the name of Christ, it shall be granted him. And this promise is unto all, even unto the ends of the earth. I can't imagine something more important that someone would ask for in the name of Christ than forgiveness and that being given. So to me, that is the greatest miracle and theme of miracles that I see here in this discussion of miracles of of Moroni. It's often couched in terms of seeing physical healings or, or any other manifestations of miracles, which are all real things, and I have testimonies of them. But nothing, I think, compares to, like I was saying, what I would call the miracle of repentance. That miracle of repentance is so transformational. The times in my life when I've truly repented, where I know I'm, I will never be the same person again, with those moments when we can say, like, I experienced my baptism, that the old person is gone, and now we stand here as a new person. Those moments are the most pure, precious, pure, just... I go to say pure again because it's like, what other word is there? There, It's just, (sighs) yeah, I agree. One of the things that frustrated me at the beginning was just when I started to come into this new understanding of repentance, like I had to repent my my idea of repentance. (laughs) (laughs) I had to see it in a new way. Like the old way that I was looking at it is just like this step-by-step methodical process to not, you know, to change my habits from sinful habits. And so it's just like, it was just this awful never getting anywhere kind of was never having any kind of new relationship with God. I was just kind of working on my habits. If I happen to have a sin that I was doing, okay, well, I got to pray X amount of times. I got to keep on praying, keep on reading my scriptures. Ah, doggone it. I forgot to do that. You know, maybe I need to pray extra five minutes to make me happier. It was just, it was just too much. But when I repented about repentance, I was like, my, like my anxiety went away. (laughs) That was amazing. And the times when I felt, you know, depressed, it just melted. Yeah, I I definitely agree. In verse 23, you know, this is just more of the same. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I don't look at this believeth as though we have to believe the right truth claims. Mm -hmm. I look at this believeth as an extension of our faith, as that was we're baptized, we're truly baptized, because over here in from verse 23, it talks about baptism, but as we come over here to verse 29, it says, See that ye are not baptized unworthily. See that ye partake not of the sacrament of Christ unworthily, but see that ye do all things in worthiness, and do it in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and if you do this and endure to the end, it will be you will in no wise be cast out. I don't look at this worthiness as, okay, good. You haven't smoked cigarettes for the, for, you know, two weeks. Good. You haven't drank for two weeks. Okay, good. You know, we've gone around, the earth has gone around in a revolution the appropriate amount of times or around this sun the appropriate amount of times. Right. And now you've, now, now I deem you worthy. And I'm like, man, this is just so stupid. Yeah. Worthiness is not really a function of time passing. Right. Especially if we're talking about the atonement in terms of infinite and eternal, why is worthiness a function of a passage of time? Yeah. So in this, we look at this and say, look, see that you're not baptized unworthily. So Riley and I did a little bit of unworthiness in uh, in the contemplation podcast. Basically what this shows it shows me, and we talked about this before with the Book of Mormon in how we deal with conversion. That there are a few different cases where conversion predates baptism, or it, it happens before baptism. So baptism, like in the waters of Mormon with the anti-Nephi-Lehi's with the people of Helaman 6, there's a conversion that happens, and then baptism is just the symbol upon which you signify that conversion that has already happened. But the Nephites, they had a different way of operating where they had such an insane and an intense view of the oath, taking it you know, from Old Old Testament to traditions, where you lived by your oath. You did the oath, and you never varied from that oath. Now, there's great utility there. There are social benefits, and there are benefits from being really true to your word. There's no doubt about that. We're not speaking against that. But the proof, is, as they say, is kind of in the pudding, where the Nephite conversion, the deep God conversion, 
was never hardly half so deep as it was among the Lamanites who were converted first and then were baptized. That in the Nephite way, living into the oath and then trying to live the oath into an experiential transformational way led them into the pride cycle where that pride cycle happened yearly, if not sometimes a couple different times in a year. Their conversion was never very deep. It was a very shallow conversion. When we are baptized from the conversion, that's what I see here. See to it that you're not baptized unworthily. In other words, what I read from this in this worthiness thing is that you have already been converted and you've already begun to see who and what God is and the love that you are already always in. Yeah, don't do don't do these ordinances just because. Yeah. Do them as a, as a witness of what you've experienced. Yeah. And that's the same thing I see here with Christ and the sacrament of unworthiness. It's because if just over here in 23 again, believe and be baptized and if we're not if we do believe not we're damned. Of course, if if we're not seeing God differently and we literally choose to not progress and to see things greater things, we're damned. We stop our progression. If I choose that I'm going to stop going to school in the fifth grade, I've damned myself from higher education. I've just, I, that's just reality. Is Are you saying you believe in public education, Chad? <laughs> stop. <laughs> so in this particular way, we, this is not that God's going to be like, okay, you are damned, go to hell. In a lot of ways, we think that, okay, you go to the terrestrial kingdom, you go to the terrestrial kingdom, you, okay, you only get the second degree of the celestial kingdom, right? Whatever. This is just, we come to the awareness of what we always are. And it's just, of course, if we don't do that, we halt our own progression. I'm going to go on to verse 31 here of chapter nine. I've always loved how he uh, phrases this. I think this is wonderful context for the whole Book of Mormon. And there's so many themes and uh, profoundness sort of tied up in this. He says, condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father because of his imperfection, neither them who have written before him, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that you may learn to be more wise than we have been. That's just like really intense humility. <laughs> like it's <laughs> like, I think if I had written that, I'd be like, read back and I'm like, Hey, that's really good humility. <laughs> <laughs> what, but but what, seriously, way to be like, self. this, this, uh, yeah, way to be self. This, this really like, he puts it so well here. Scripture is written by imperfect men. And if we are expecting it to be perfect, then we are imagining up unto ourselves a God which doesn't exist. That's not the way God doesn't work with perfect people in that sense, right? He takes our imperfections and invites us to forgive each other and see and experience him despite the imperfections that we see in each other. The Book of Mormon, to me, because of if we ever find imperfections in it, and you know, I, as we've gone through it, there's obviously things here and there that are that are inconsistent and problematic. But to me, that is just a testament to its inspiration or divine origin or whatever you want to call it to be. But just that uh, the Lord meant us to have it. I like it. So Moroni signs off telling us once again that these things are written, that we may rid our garments of the blood of our brethren who have dwindled in unbelief. But I need to study more about the blood and the sins of our generation. Mm -hmm. I have a couple ideas and what that means. Nothing enough to go into about right now. And behold, these things which we have desired concerning our brethren, yea, even the restoration to the knowledge of Christ are according to the prayers of all the saints who have dwelt in the land. And may the Lord Jesus Christ grant that their prayers may be answered according to their faith. And may God the Father remember the covenant which he hath made with the house of Israel. And may he bless them forever through the faith on the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They would have been great if they ended there. The fact that we have two extra books is fantastic. I can't wait to get into them. But man, just that alone, that's a beautiful way to summarize and to, and to end. That for Mormon and Moroni, for all intents and purposes, is the end. That's the point. That's everything. Right. It seems to be what they intended it to be. Yeah. yeah. Originally. Just this whole 
coming to Christ, repenting and being baptized. And this record will find you. And when it finds you, know that we were in, we intended to find you. And it really shows the hyperactive and the proactive nature of God in our lives. That he's always there, always coming for us, always revealing things for us. And we just need to open our eyes and be able to see that that's the case. Agreed. <laughs> Awesome. All right, everybody. So next week we have, uh, I believe we have three weeks in ether and those are great. I'm hoping we have three weeks in ether anyway. There's just a lot of stuff there. Yeah, I think there's three in ether and three in Moroni. Three in Moroni. Awesome. And then we have a Christmas episode. <laughs> yeah. What are we going to do for a Christmas episode? <laughs> I don't know. We'll do should for we Christmas. just like, we should just sing Christmas music. No. Yeah, nobody wants to hear that from me. <laughs> We're not going to get very many <laughs> listens on that one. <laughs> no, no one's going to listen to that. They're going to tune into that and they're going to tune it real fast. So. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, it's been a great discussion. So we look back to hearing you guys next week. If uh, Drop us a message if you've uh, enjoyed it. If there's any questions that you've had, um, share it with family, friends, anybody who think is uh, would also benefit from the message. And uh, until next week then, I'm Shiloh Logan. And I'm Ben Peterson. Thanks everybody for listening.